graduate from Oregon State. She's done her internship here at Luna Spaces. And uh, she's uh, our uh, field out there in that cool area. So those who live out in cool. And, uh, and she also works here with all the emergencies that uh, needed when she has the time. So give her a great round of applause. And, uh, There's a couple of seats over here. Yeah, there's some seats up here in the front. This one's a little bit lighter. I, I have to admit, if I saw one out on the trail, I probably can 
Godzilla deference. I don't think I would care. But. <laughs> <laughs> so next, where do we find these rattlesnakes? Um, you know, everyone thinks that the rattlesnakes just live like out on the trails, like out on the Olmsted Loop, and I have seen them and ran over them with my horse. And you guys probably have too, but they actually live in a lot of different places. I saw a horse that was bitten by a rattlesnake last spring that lived in Granite Bay and she lived on irrigated pasture. So it's not necessarily just under brush piles and rocks. Yes, they do like those areas, but um, you can expect to find them just about everywhere in our practice area. You know, we do see a lot of them in Poole and Auburn. But we see a lot in Lincoln and Wheatland and Sheridan, so they're really everywhere in, in Granite Bay too. So um, they will hang out in hay sheds, garages, your backyard. Um, there was one resource that I found, and I, I can totally see this, where a lot of them will like to hang out under door frames because it's a perfect spot for a snake. Um, so you can see, here's some chickens hanging out with a snake like right next to the garden shed. Um, this is a picture of a horse looking through the horse's ears out on the Olmstead Loop. This is probably in the summer, you can see how dry it is, so that's a great time to see snakes up there. And then this snake down here, you can see how camouflaged this is. Like, it, they're hard to see if you're out um, on the trail. This is actually on the John Muir Trail up by Lake Tahoe. So, yeah, they're a problem for you and your horses, but they're a problem for yourself hiking or if you hike with your dogs. Um, I'm not going to go into rattlesnakes with dogs because that's a whole other topic, but um, it's definitely an issue. So let's say that you're out on a trail ride or you come home from grocery shopping and your horse has been bitten by a rattlesnake. Either you saw the horse get bit or you suspect that your horse has gotten bit. What should you do? First of all, um, stay calm. I know that's way easier said than done because usually when we have rattlesnake calls, people are pretty frantic. And it's understandable, it's distressing. Horses swell up really quickly, um, especially when they get bit on the face. So the most common place for horses to get bit by rattlesnakes is either on the face, usually right on their muzzle, or on their lower legs. The face is usually, we see that more often in horses that are like out in pasture. Horses are very curious by nature. You guys know this about them. They hear a rattle, they see something moving around, they want to walk up to it and investigate. And then as they're investigating, they make the snake pretty angry and it'll give them a big fat bite on the nose. The leg bites that I have personally seen are more often people that are riding their horses um, so you're riding on the trail, and you step over a log, there's a snake on the other side. I saw a horse last year that was riding at Cronin Ranch, that exact same situation. Stepped over a log on the other side and got bit in the leg. So those are the most common places that you're going to see that your horses get bit. So if you find your horse in a pasture with a head swollen, you know, two, three times its normal size, there's a good chance that they got bit by a rattlesnake, but I'll show you guys all those gruesome <coughs> pictures. Um, so I would say the first thing you should do is give us a call. I would say pretty much all rattlesnake bites need uh, veterinary attention. There, there are some wives tales about how you can treat rattlesnakes on your own, but um, the mortality in horses is actually quite low if you get help from a vet. So you guys know we're here 24 hours a day. If your horse gets bit, call us right away and we will be out to you as fast as we can. Or if you're already loading up in the trailer from a trailer ride, come straight down to us. It's, it's really important that we see your horse as fast as possible. Um, and then also, if you can prevent your horse from moving around too much, honestly, these guys usually don't get frantic to the point where they're trying to run around. Um, most of the time, they're really painful, and so they're usually hanging out in one spot, trembling, you know. So they're not going to run around on their own, usually. Um, depending on how smart they are, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what not to do. So there's a lot of things that you shouldn't do. 
Um, there's a lot of first aid techniques that can actually be detrimental for snake bites. Um, research has shown that a lot of these older techniques actually can spread venom more quickly, um, can delay healing, and be detrimental to your horse. So number one, don't apply a tourniquet to your horse's leg. If you've got a horse that's got a bite on the leg and they're swelling, you can put like a compression wrap, like a stack wrap that goes all the way up, but don't tie a tight tourniquet around their leg. It doesn't help and it can make things worse. Um, the other thing that doesn't help with snake bites is applying cold packs or ice. Um, and then the other thing, you guys probably have seen pictures of like snake venom suction kits. Um, it's been shown that those do not help in people, they do not help in dogs, they do not help in horses. So if you have one of those, I'll just throw it away. Like, I don't know. Um, so don't use those. Don't try and cut open where your horse has been bit. Um, just try and keep everything quiet and we'll get to you guys as fast as you can. So now, now that you suspect that your horse has been bit, I'm just gonna show you guys some pictures of what horse bites look like um, and how, or not horse bites, snake bites. <laughs> and um, what we're gonna do to figure out how to help the horse. So clinical signs, you can see this horse on the left. Um, she has a big fat head because she got bit on the face. Um, actually, this is my left, but that's not right. <laughs> This one here, um, the hind leg is swollen, this left hind leg is swollen. And I don't know if you guys can appreciate this, but up in his sheet, he's swollen too. So um, when you're talking about leg swelling from snake bites, you can describe it like stovepipe swelling, really large swelling, and then their face can be, you know, literally two, three times the size of normal. So they look like a cartoon, as you can see this horse does. Can you see actually the bite? How could you tell that it's this and not something else? And how do you know between the difference in the wound and the bite? We're going to go over that. <laughs> Don't worry. Here's some other pictures. Um, this one here is more acute. And this is a bite that's a little bit older. So um, this is the assumption, you know, this horse, you know, this bite is days, you know, a week old. So I would hope this horse has already been treated. But what can happen, and I'm gonna tell you about the pathogenesis of snake bites, is it causes necrosis of the skin. So that's why you can see a lot of skin sloughing. Um, they can heal and they can get better, but they can look pretty rough for a while. So um, that's not too uncommon when they get bit on the face like that. Okay, so maybe some of you are wondering how the venom works. Why does it cause all of these problems? So um, the way rattlesnakes kill their prey is they you know, insert a mixture of enzymes, protein, proteins, and peptides. And those all work together to um, essentially render their prey so they can't run away. You know, a rat or goat or whatever they're eating, lizards. They're small, so a bite from a rattlesnake is, if it doesn't kill them, they're not gonna be moving so that the snake can eat them. Um, but in a, a horse or a human or a dog, um, they don't necessarily die. Um, so what happens is there are different things in the venom and the venom will damage their skin cells, it'll damage their muscle tissue, and then there are hemorrhage toxins that affect the coagulation ability in so that's why you'll have horses that have prolonged clotting times um, because it damages their PT and PTT. Those are what helps with clotting. They also can destroy platelets. Platelets are another part of the blood that allows the blood to clot. So that's why a lot of these horses will have like spontaneous bleeding from their nose, their eyes, their mouth because they're not clotting like they should be. Um, so the venom Basically, it causes general cell death in the area in which they were bitten. Um, it causes endothelial, endothelial damage, and that's when we're talking about blood vessels. So you have damage to the vessels, which can make those vessels leaky, 
they can become hypovolemic, which results in a decrease in blood pressure. Um, and then they also have, like I said, the coagulation abnormalities, so they're not clotting, clotting normally. Um, and the ability to clot blood is synonymous with life. You have to be able to do that. Um, horses are so big that it's not always as serious with them as it is with a human or a dog, um, but they still obviously need treatment. Um, and the reason it's not as serious is because we're talking about the amount of venom put into a horse. They are so heavy, they um, weigh so much, they have so much more mass compared to a human or a dog. That's why it's not as serious for them. Um, and then they also can have muscle damage, muscle death. Um, so that's why you'll see like sloughing of skin and even the muscles underneath might die um, and be necrotic. And they also sometimes can cause like a neuropathy. They can insert neurotoxins. Those usually don't affect horses quite as much because like I said, they're so big. But in smaller animals like their prey, um, it can prevent them from moving around because their nervous system isn't operating correctly. We're gonna do all the questions at the end. <laughs> I'll remind you, it's fine. Okay, so kind of getting back to what you said, snake bite diagnosis. It's not always as straightforward as you think it is. Unless you actually saw your horse get bit or they have a big cartoon head, sometimes hard to tell if they got bit on a leg. How many of you guys think that this leg is a snake, snake bite leg? Yeah, so this is actually a cellulitis leg, but this could be a snake bite leg too. This could be early on. So, um, it's like I say, you can't be sure that it's necessarily a snake bite because cellulitis can look the same way. Cellulitis is infection in the subcutaneous space of a leg, and so they get really swollen too. They can get almost as swollen as a horse with a snake bite um, if it's been going on long enough. But um, one of the things that we use to try and figure this out is just obviously their clinical signs. Do they have two puncture wounds? Um, sometimes if we clip the hair on a leg, we can find the two puncture wounds. That gives us an idea. Um, was the swelling really rapid? Like did you lead and you came back an hour later and your horse has a leg this big? You know, cellulitis usually doesn't progress that. Um, and then they'll also, like we talked about, they might have broken blood vessels. Um, so we'll see like petechiation, those are the little pinpoints on their gums. They might have spontaneous bleeding from their nostrils, their eyes, their mouth. That would give us you know, an indication that yeah, we probably are dealing with a snake bite. For me, if we think it's a snake bite, I'm not gonna mess around and be like, oh, it might be cellulitis. You know, like we're gonna get moving on taking care of your horse. Um, the other thing that we'll do, to, you know, after we get your horse stabilized, we'll pull blood to begin with, but this will be running while we're working on your horse. Some of the laboratory findings and the blood work, they'll have decreased white blood cells. So if you guys are science buffs, you know what about white blood cells, that means they can have a decrease in lymphocytes, a decrease in neutrophils, decreased platelets, that's known as thrombocytopenia, and they can also have decreased protein and then the prolonged clotting times. We can test PT and PTT, um, so that's how we get an idea of you know, how, how bad your horse is off. If they've got really prolonged clotting times, then we're gonna need to be more aggressive about their care. Okay, moving on to treatment. So we know your horse got bit by a rattlesnake. Um, the number one thing that we need to maintain is an airway in your horse. Because like we talked about, a lot of horses get bit on the face. And so horses are nasal breathers. They can't breathe through their mouth like we can. If they have swelling on their face and their nasal passage is closing, they can't breathe. Really what it comes down to is if horses are going to die acutely from a rattlesnake bite, it's because you know if they got bit out in pasture, no one found them, they got bit on the face and their nasal passage closed, they can't breathe. So they can actually suffocate from these bites. That's why taking action quickly is so serious. So 75% of horses that are bit on the face are going to require a tracheostomy. Not all of them. I saw a horse last year that got bit on the face. But 75% of them. 
Yeah. So um, the way trachs work, if you guys have ever seen one in a horse, they're pretty cool. Um, <laughs> and they're not that hard to do. I mean, what we do is we incise on the neck. This is looking under the horse. The trachea on the horse is really easy to feel. If you guys palpate your horse's neck, you can feel that part too. That's their windpipe. So what we do is we just incise through the skin, part the muscles there, and then we'll incise into the trachea itself. This is what the trach looks like. It's got this duct fill. And so these go into the trachea and they'll sit in there flat like that. Um, some horses can be panicky when they can't breathe. That's not surprising. And it's pretty amazing as soon as you incise into the trachea and they can start breathing in that way, they relax so quickly, you know, they're so happy that they can breathe. So um, we'll usually leave these in until the swelling has resolved in their head. That can take a few days. And then when we pull them out, they'll have a ugly little hole in their neck that heals. We pull it out and it heals by second intention. It takes a couple weeks to heal. Um, but you know, they, they do pretty well with them, and we put a lot of them in, so they're fun to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to spend a bit of time talking about antivenin, because antivenin is the gold standard of treatment for snake bites um, in humans, dogs, cats, horses. And a lot of people say anti-venom, it's actually anti-venin, but you can describe the treatment as an anti-venom treatment. So that's why it gets confusing. I try to use the right wordage, but it's not always going to be. Um, this is made from an equine hyperimmune serum with venom from rattlesnakes, from the pit viper family, obviously. And what it is, is it's a solution of IgG, IgG is their immune immunoglobulins and other serum proteins, uh, mainly albumin. So um, after we've got your horse stabilized, you're not going to need a trach, that's obviously the first thing that we do. Um, we might have blood work running, but if I'm out in the field with your horse, we'll you know, obviously get this before we have blood work, we're not going to do that out of the truck. Um, we'll place a catheter, an IV catheter in your horse, and we dilute the antivenin and we give it in like a liter of saline. So um, it takes about 20 minutes to give. Most horses require one to two vials. This is very different from humans. Human snake bite victims actually require usually 10 to 15 vials of antivenin. And dogs and cats require more too. Um, and it's not really clear why horses don't need as much as humans do. Um, Someone other than myself is hopefully doing some research on that. Um, so this is really what we're going to push for. It's a little expensive, um, but horses have good outcome when we are able to give anti-venin. Um, and in humans, this is really how they gauge their improvement after a rattlesnake bite, is when they've given anti-venin, and it actually decreases pain, um, it decreases swelling, so that's what we're looking at in our horses too, um, and they do really well from it. So I recommend antivenin to all of our snake bite victims, and I think all of our other doctors would agree. Um, depends if you have to give one or two vials. You know, you're looking at probably like six hundred to a thousand dollars. So. It's, for the treatment, so, yeah. So, other treatment, um, this poor guy. Um, this is not at our hospital, but also we want to provide pain relief. Um, the anti-venin itself does provide pain relief, but we'll sometimes also give NSAIDs like banamine. Um, IV fluids are important in these horses because they can become hypovolemic as part of the pathogenesis of the venom. So getting them on IV fluids. If they're having a lot of potty abnormalities, you know, sometimes we'll do a plasma transfusion, a blood transfusion, but it doesn't get to that point most of the time. Um, if you're
your horse is not up to date on its tetanus vaccine, then we'll go ahead and booster that as well. Um, and then some other treatments. This is where rattlesnake bite treatments get really controversial. So antibiotics. In humans, human studies have shown that antibiotics don't improve the outcome of snake bite victims. Um, same is true in dogs. But we know that snake fangs can carry various bacteria on them that horses are very sensitive, specifically Clostridium. So um, many times we will put horses on antibiotics to prevent infection down the line. Um, but really, like I said before, the anti-venin is, is the standard of care. Steroids too, um, some of you have probably heard about treating dogs or horses with steroids after they've been bitten by snake bites. Um, they actually have shown that steroids can decrease healing and they're detrimental. So we don't use those in our practice anymore for uh, horse snake bites. I can't speak to the small animal veterinarians, but we really moved away from using steroids because it's been shown that they don't help. So prevention, pretty tough around here. Um, it's just kind of bad luck when you get your horse gets bit by a rattlesnake unless you like purposely walk into that. Um, this is a snake um, at Cronin Ranch, and these are some riders enjoying their day also at Cronin Ranch. Um, so really staying alert is your best bet. There is a rattlesnake vaccine available, which we do carry, um, and while the vaccine is not enough to make your horse be okay after the, they've been bitten by a rattlesnake, it, may, it might buy you some time. So um, if you're far away, if we're far away, if your horse isn't va vaccinated, it might buy you some time. Um, so there is that vaccine available. And then last, we have some questions. Um, is it guinea hens? They kill rattlesnakes. I think he talks to you too. I've said that before, it's funny. And then, I don't know if any of you guys remember these toys. I remember I had, there's like a rubber band and a metal thing yeah. you can put it in there and it sounds like a rattlesnake. So I was hoping for her. So, okay. Oh boy, okay, you were first. Yes. Um, so we're out of the trail and from in a couple miles out. We get a leg bike, what do we do? So the poor horse and people that happened to last year. Um, they did walk back to the trailer. I think it was slow going for them, but they did walk back to the trailer. Um, I think that's really your only option. I guess, you know, I'm a hiker, so if you want to wait out there, like, I'll make out to you, but um, we're going to have to move your horse off the trail at some point, so um, that, that would be my recommendation is to try and get back to the trailer. Then trailer to the bed. Uh, either trailer to the vet, or if you can call on the trail and we can yeah. meet you at the parking lot. Yeah. So, I mean, but the, the, there's just really nothing more we could do at this time but just to slowly walk the horse off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, usually like giving bandamine or something like that. It's not necessarily going to hurt, but um, the it's not going to negate the swelling probably. Could you put a, a, a bandaging wrap on at the time? If you had a bandit, you know, like a standing wrap that you yeah. wanted to apply some steady pressure, you could. Just no turning things. Right, yeah. great. But what we've learned today has been very helpful in that, and it's something, since we all ride out there, we do. It sounds like it could be yeah. Yeah. something to carry. Chris, what if you're way, way out? Yeah. Like, <laughs> high Sierra, yeah. no cell phone <laughs> service. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Make sure is that when you're passing that piece of garden hose, 
you're keeping it ventral, so along the floor, because if you, you know, put it up, you're liable to hit the ethanoids and cause a new uh, nosebleed, and they've already got clotting issues, so that'd be best to avoid. Um, but it's worth a shot. I personally have not heard of anyone succeeding at that out in the field, but it's worth a shot. But if we're, I mean, you know, we go on the big camp trip yeah. and stuff. If we're, you know, really far out, no yeah. cell service. Is well, there a kit that we can put together? Anything that we can do to buy time or do the vaccination? The and vaccination might that. buy you some time. I would say in your case, Chris, I could probably teach you how to do a take and get an anti-fungal. <laughs> 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 Um, it's complicated in the fact that it has to be diluted and given over a certain 